and welcome to the Answer Podcast, where we dive into the compelling stories of leaders and professionals from diverse fields in the military. I'm your host, Manuel Calo, and today we're joined by a very special guest, Lieutenant Coronel Mariela Peña. Before we started, uh, before we get started, I want to remind everyone that uh, the opinions and views shared in this podcast are those of the participants and do not reflect the official stance of our position of the Department of Defense or any branch of the United States military. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Peña has an exceptional career in the United States Marine Corps, and she's here to share her insights and experiences with us. Welcome to the ANSA podcast, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel uh, Peña. Hey, how's it going, ma'am? Thank you for being here. Gracias. Muchas gracias. De nada, gracias por estar aquí. Today we are in the Potomac Winery here in Stafford, Virginia. How do you feel about this? I feel great. Thank you. <laughs> you didn't even know, but I love wine, and I I love um, drinking wine. I grew up in the Napa area. Oh, okay, Napa so, Valley. So, yeah. in Napa Valley, so this was a perfect place for me to have an interview. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I, know, I know you wanted to do this, like, uh, face-to-face face yes. uh, instead of being like virtual or zoom yeah. and we are like a middle point between you and I because I'm in Richmond and you're in DC so this is a perfect place and when I was looking mm -hmm. for places I was like let's go to the Potomac winery and check it out for those that listen an amazing place that you can actually come out yeah. and visit so ma'am uh, first of all again thank you for being here with us tonight today uh, we're gonna share with your bio and your experiences through the Marine Corps for the actual audience and, and they can get some mentorship from this conversation. But before we do that, let's go back in time. So who is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mariela Peña back from Managua, Nicaragua? Can you start your, your journey? Yeah, that's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> I grew up in Managua, Nicaragua, and we left Nicaragua during the Sandinista Revolution. And we came to the United States as refugees during in 1980s. Mm -hmm. And we came over here, my family and I, the week before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And we, we were stuck in San Diego for a little while. And then while we were waiting for my brothers to come through, because I, my, my, my mom, myself, and my sister, we were able to come legally to the United States mm -hmm. um, as refugees. But my brothers had to come in through the border illegally. So we, oh, wow. we were waiting for them to come into San Diego. And while we were waiting for them, we were there for like a week. And they finally came through the border. And when we were driving on the I-5 going north to San Diego, going to San Jose, where we were staying with an aunt, a sister of my, my dad. And, and my mom said, the Christmas present for all of us is going to be just us being together. Mm -hmm. There's no Christmas presents because we had spent all of our money on the hotel, on the flights. Um, and getting my brothers through the border. So we were like, okay, no Christmas presents. And well, then fast forward to a couple weeks before Christmas, I think about a week before Christmas, we were in San Jose waiting to get enrolled in school. We didn't speak English, nothing. And we well, were living in, in the attic of my aunt's house. Well, and I mean, it was conditioned, but it was one room, all six of us, we were all in one room. And... Well, my dad was, he had a job as a janitor, and we were just getting settled into the United States. And one day, lo and behold, guess who shows up to, to the driveway? Who? A truck full of toys. Okay. With Marines. With my own oh, Marines. Okay, so that's the toys uh, that they just do on, uh, on the Christmas. Toys like, for Tots. To toys for Tots, okay. So that year, in 1986, December of 1986, I had the biggest Christmas probably in my entire life at that time. Because during the revolution, we only got like one gift. You know, maybe we got a fruit or something during Christmas because there was just such scarcity everywhere. Yeah. And so instead, when the Marines came, they, they had a five ton full of toys. Wow. It was just all packed up. And they said, you can grab whatever you want. You can grab anything you want. And I just said that day that I was going to drive trucks for the Marine Corps for the rest of my life. Wow. And then, um, you know, fast forward a couple yeah. years later when I was in high school, mm -hmm. somebody told me that they didn't take women 
And so I was like, oh, they don't take women. So, so you we're know? talking back then in 1995. Yeah. Which is, it was more like a... Well, 93. So 93, then, yeah, okay. so you fast forward to 93. I'm like in high school, yeah. figuring out if I'm going to go to college or what I'm going to do. And I wanted to join the Marine Corps, but they told me that they weren't accepting women. And obviously that wasn't true. Okay. Yeah. And I, But it took me a little bit to figure that out. I ran into a recruiter when I started college at... Mm -hmm. uh, in 95. Okay. In 95, I ran into a recruiter. He's like, can you run? And I said, yes, I ran cross country. <laughs> and he, they got me in and I was, I was able to enlist right away wow. and, and go to boot camp. And that was just for me, a dream come true. So, so that was your inspiration, basically, those Marines coming to your neighborhood with the Toys for Tots. That was a big inspiration, like, hey, I want to join the Marine Corps, but one point, that's basically drove your decision in 1993 to 1995, yeah. right? What I, what inspired me is that when you think about, you know, the most, the hardest uh, organization to get into, and at that time I was a little kid, mm -hmm. so it was the American military, and the Marine Corps just seemed Like, they were just war fighters. Yeah. What are they doing helping yeah. children? Yeah. And for me, that touched a special uh, place in my heart because for the Marine Corps to be the finest war fighting organization in the world, mm -hmm. to then also still take care of the most vulnerable of children yeah. and really care about them and make sure that they feel secure because getting a toy for Christmas doesn't just mean getting a toy to play with, but it, it means security, it means welcome to the United States. It means that, to me, it just meant that I was I was meant to be here. Hi, uh, gotcha. And then, so how was that transition in 1995 once you enlisted in the, in the Marine Corps? How was that transition coming from high school to actual basic training? That time? I mean, it was difficult, like it is for all of us. I I was not prepared, you know, I, I think mentally and emotionally for a boot camp. But you have to adjust, right? You have to adjust. You put one foot in front of the other, and and then you just have to decide that you are going to make it through. Yeah. And, and through the help of all the drill instructors and all the other recruits, then you, you make it through. You figure out how to become a team, and then you succeed together. And that, to me, was my first leadership lesson mm -hmm. that, I, that I really just cemented in my brain that we do things together in the Marine Corps. And that was another thing that I absolutely loved. Because when you join, you join for yourself. Yeah. But then when you're in the Marine Corps, you're there because of everybody else. I see, I see. And then, so once you joined the Marine Corps, what's next for you? Now you're in the system. What was next for Mariela Peña? So I joined in the Marine Corps Reserves because I was a single mom and I was raising my son and I wanted to be at home to raise my son. Even though when it, back in that time you had to give up custody of your child for you to go to boot camp. Yeah. I, after I graduated from boot camp and went to MOS school, I, was, I grabbed my son back from his dad and he lived with me and I, helped, and I raised him while he helped me. And I got a job at the Contra Costa and the Times newspaper. Okay. But I really, I really just loved being a Marine. Yeah. So every time that I could find orders to get on orders to go do something fun, then I would. I would. So I, I, started, I started college. As soon as I got back, I got a full-time job. I was in the reserves. And then I was just really just plugging along on my college studies. So, yeah, so talk about college. So talking about college, so do you use any benefits that the Marine Corps and the military offered to you in that time? No, at that time I didn't. One, because I didn't know. So, okay. oh, well, actually I did. I used my GI Bill. Oh, yeah, okay. Because the GI Bill for the reserves at that time was about $200 a month. Okay. But it was a lot of money, mm -hmm. and it covered all of my my community college expenses and and when I transitioned to the University of Phoenix mm -hmm. I just got a student loan but then the Marine Corps paid for all of my student loans when okay. I transitioned to become an officer. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. And then what was your, your major uh, when you transitioned to the University of Phoenix? At the time? 
I was I was majoring in business and business administration. Yeah. Yeah. And then okay, and then what made you actually do that transition from a list of now to be an officer? So okay. what was the sticking point? So I in two thousand five I deployed to Iraq mm -hmm. with my reserve unit. We got activated, um, got deployed to Camp Lejeune, and then I deployed with CLB-8, Combat Logistics Battalion 8 from Camp Lejeune, and we went to Iraq. And we were, um, the battalion was stationed in, in Fallujah, but I was, by, the, by that time I was a sergeant, so I was the staff and CO, and I was about to pick up staff sergeant. So I was a staff and CO for um, the arrival and departure control group, which is really, a landing zone for the uh, for First Marine Division, and then it swapped over to Second Marine Division at that time. And I, I had so much autonomy, leadership, and I got to run the show with my Marines and and help the division do their mission. Yeah. And when I came home, I wanted to do more. I wanted to do more. The idea of going back to, by, by then, I was a city planner at the city of Oakley, yeah. and they had held my job for me. Okay. And, um, so I, you, you, went deploy, you went deploy, and then the city actually held your, your position yeah. while you were deployed until you came back. Yeah. Okay. And then when I came back, I, well, while I was in Iraq, I was processing my application for my citizenship. So nobody in my family at that time had gotten their citizenship yet. So, you know, you're young, you don't really know how things work. But um, the division SJA helped me to fill out all my applications, and they were having a ceremony, and it was a joint ceremony for all services, for uh, Marines, airmen, soldiers to get their citizenship in Iraq. Okay, okay. So they flew me to Baghdad to, to swear in. Uh, unfortunately for me, the, the paperwork didn't come through in time, so I didn't swear in in Baghdad. Huh? I swore in in the city of San Francisco when I came back. So how, yeah. how difficult, now you're talking about uh, citizenship, how difficult was it? It was any difficult to actually apply for citizenship while you were in the Marine Corps? Well, when the SJA told me that I could apply, I, at that time, didn't think it was possible. It just seemed so complicated and burdensome. Okay. Okay. And I said, well, I, you know, I, I've always thought about it. I'm going to do it at some point in time but I've never made the time. And he's like, you can do it now and I'll help you. And we filled out a couple of forms, kind of walked me through the process. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the process, I figured out it was pretty easy. Okay. And then what made it a lot easier is that I was in a combat zone. Oh, see. So then they were able to process or speed my, my application through mm -hmm. because that's what the State Department was doing at that time, I believe. Mm -hmm. And... And then looking back on it, it was one of the foundational decisions of my life. Nice. That's, yeah. It's pretty nice to hear. Um, and then I know some listeners who maybe they're seeking to actually apply for citizenship yes. today, today. So would you give me any advice right now to those? Yes. Who yes. Uh, go to your legal services office yeah. and an attorney there should be able to get you and help you set up through the process. If you're not able to make an appointment, then just Google it. There's a lot of information out there for service members to apply for their citizenship yep. and how, how easy the DOD makes it for us to do it because we've already enlisted and we're already showing our commitment, commitment to our to nation. The United States, yeah. yeah. So yeah. You, you're actually serving the, the, the United States and, and that will give you a leeway to actually facilitate a little bit more for apply for citizenship. Yes. Uh, but some people don't maybe don't know the process like you said before maybe it's like hey, it's too difficult but if they actually look for guidance and seek for that guidance in this case with the SEA or the legal advisor they, they can get in the right path yes right? Um, now how was that transition from being now an enlisted to being an officer so how was that process yes so I, I came back from Iraq and I'm sitting com coming back from Iraq I think I took two weeks off work and then went back to my civilian job. Mm -hmm. And it was just unreal. It seemed like that I'm like back at home, you know. And, and even though I, I really loved my job in Oakley, yeah. I, it didn't seem as exciting anymore. Uh, okay. Because cool. I wasn't in charge of Marines. 
and all the things that we did in Iraq were just amazing. And so I, I at that time didn't think that I could process my application, so I, I, I ended up transferring to the individual ready reserve. So I got out completely of the Marine Corps reserves and, and transitioned into the individual ready reserve, which is a non-drilling status. So then I could apply to get my master's degree. And I said, well, you know, I'm at the city. They've offered me a really good position and I'm, I'm succeeding. I'm being really successful. So I started my college or my master's program at UC Davis. And, and one night after class, I was going to class in the evenings, I, I ran into a recruiter. And then he's like, well, I, you know, telling him the whole story. He's like, well, where did you get out? You know? And I'm like, well, I'm not sure. He's like, well, what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, I always wanted to become an officer. And he's like, well, why don't you do it? And I'm like, why don't I do it? Yes. And then in the background, though, there's... Um, the Marine Corps League, I belong to the Marine Corps League, and that whole group of men just really took me under their wing. I was kind of like their granddaughter. Yeah. And every month, Mariella, what are you gonna do next? What's next for you? You should become an officer. You already have your bachelor's degree. So I had that, um, like a group of people that really believed in me yeah. and believed in things that I was capable of that I wasn't, yet sure I was capable of yeah. but the other thing that made it like, made it in my mind that yes I could do it was when I was deployed in Iraq that was the first time that I saw female lieutenants okay. being in charge because at that time yeah. so I was in boot camp in the Marine Corps and then it was all women drill instructors yeah. but when I came to my unit I never really saw any women and especially no officers yeah. And when I went to Iraq and getting to see those women, lieutenants, captains, Lead, leading, Marine. leading Marines, and being in charge, and really just being inspiring, that made me think, I can do that. You can do that. So that, that gives you the it. strength and uh, the inspiration to yeah. actually become an officer in the Marine yeah. Corps. That's pretty awesome. And then, so what you had to do to become become an officer? What you had to do, like the process? How was it? The process was relatively easy. I was already in the reserves, mm -hmm. so I was. My name was in the system. So when I showed up to the recruiting office, they just looked me up. They looked at my record. Mm -hmm. They said you're eligible. Nice. I. The only thing we need you to do is run a physical fitness test. Okay. And I said, you want me to run one now? I ran one like two weeks ago, and I, and I maxed it out. They're like, yes, we need you to run a PFT. And I said, okay, who's going to run it with me? And then the gunny at the recruiting office had to go and run it with me. And so I maxed out the run, I maxed up the PFT, and then they said, yes, start your application. And it was just, you know, I had already done my citizenship application. I had already, like, bought a house. Wow. So I, I filled out the application right away. I resubmitted it, I had an interview, they boarded my package, mm -hmm. and they said, you're ready to go. And, and the other, the one like critical requirement was I had to be a citizen. Okay. And I had oh, already I done that. Okay, yeah. I, I did that right after I came back from Iraq. Iraq yeah. So that was a good decision that then enabled me to make other good decisions. Nice, nice. Speaking about the house, how was the process? Do you utilize the VA uh, when you bought the house at the moment? Or no, you did not know about it? So, no, I, I didn't know at the time. So I was working at the city, and they had programs for single parents yeah. and, and people of low income. So mm -hmm. I went through their housing office at the city, and they got me, they walked me through the loan. So I bought my first house. Mm -hmm. I think right after I turned 21, a little tiny condo. Uh, but I bought it at the time when uh, real estate prices were going up. Going, yeah. So that was another great decision that, um, because I was surrounded with smart, intelligent, and, and thoughtful people, yeah. that they made me think about my future in ways that, you know, I wouldn't have if, if I had been on my own. That's pretty, pretty awesome. Now, so once you became an officer, so what's next for Mariela? Uh, so once I became an officer, I went to uh, officer candidate school, 
then the basic school for the uh, for the Marine Corps and all officers in the Marine Corps go to the basic school. That's a six month long school that teaches you how to be a platoon commander and develops your leadership skills to lead Marines, essentially, and lead Marines in combat. And after that, then you go to your uh, military operational, military occupational specialty, mm -hmm. your MOS school. Okay. And I wanted to become a logistician because in, when I was enlisted, I was a supply marine, I was landing support. Mm -hmm. So I was in the supply field before, and I didn't want to let go of all that experience, including all my combat experience. Right. So then they, they let me become a logistics officer and it was the same thing. So my son at that time was 13. So I didn't really quite feel that I could go on active duty because I didn't want to leave him behind and I didn't want to move him around. So I joined, when I became an officer, I, I took a reserve commission, but the whole entry level pipeline to become an officer is about a year long. And of course, at the end of that year, almost at the tail end of the year, I. I broke my ankle, oh, okay. and and I was on limited duty, so they had to keep me on active duty. So they brought me back to San Jose, kept me on active duty for another year mm -hmm. while I healed, and then as soon as I healed, there was an opportunity for me to go to Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and then I could not turn it down yeah. to to go through all the training and then be given the opportunity to have a platoon and be a platoon commander, I couldn't turn it down. So I went to Afghanistan as a, as a first lieutenant. I had already gotten um, first lieutenant. And, and I had another incredible experience leading Marines nice, nice. in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan. So you've been in many deployments. So which deployment has marked, marked you the most out of all your deployments? I mean, I would say the 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 Afghanistan, Afghanistan. deployment mm -hmm. and and the reason for that is because I had such a large platoon mm -hmm. we had a platoon of almost I think 50 Marines mm -hmm. but when we would do convoys we would, our mission our main mission was to deliver fuel mm -hmm. all over Helmand province mm -hmm. and we would be out outside of Leatherneck just delivering fuel what we would do is we would escort the local nationals with their fuel trucks. So I was responsible for hundreds of people wow. in, one, in one convoy, and we would be out for two, three, three and a half weeks at a time, wow. delivering fuel to all the combat units and all the FOBs. Um, and that, for me, was fundamentally changing. Right. I... I became comfortable being a leader, mm -hmm. being a combat leader, mm -hmm. and and that's what made me think that the Marine Corps is for me. They, the Marine Corps, has given me so many opportunities to succeed, and that's and by then my son was like 15, 16. I said, well, I can transition on active duty because he's old enough now, mm -hmm. and and I transitioned. I couldn't transition. Uh, right away onto active duty, so I went on the active reserve program. Mm -hmm. So they picked me up on the active reserve program, sent me down to First Civil Affairs Group in okay. in Camp Pendleton, okay. and then my my son stayed back in 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 Northern California to graduate from high school. And once he graduated from high school, then I brought him back to San Diego with me. Yeah, so so many challenges to be a single mom, right, and be in the service, um, but. It seems that you, you made it work, right? At the end, you made some decisions like, hey, I don't want to, I, I, I cannot go now active duty, but then I'm going to wait for the right time when my, my son is old enough, and then, right? And then I'm going to do this, those transitions. And it's glad to hear because I know there's a lot of single parents that right now that, that might be in the system or in any other system, you know, dealing. Can you yeah. give them a piece of advice for those that are listening? For those challenges, based yes. on your own experiences. So based on my own experience, I was I was never shy asking for help, okay. and never shy telling people what my my reality was, because you can't really commit to something without you know telling people what your boundaries are. Like I have to pick up my son because nobody else is going to pick him up, 
And then even though his grandparents were close by and they helped yeah. significantly, oh, yeah, yeah. his dad helped significantly, um, there was a lot of times where I would bring him to work with me. I would bring him to the supply office and the warehouse and he'd like play in the warehouse while he's running around the kids and then when the staff and CEOs would come in, I would just hide him. He would just hide him. Yeah. And nobody would know. <laughs> I'm sure they all knew. But they kind of, they just, they made me feel like part of the family and they took care of me because I was honest, I was direct, and but I also worked really hard. So I think relationships are two-way streets and if you work hard, a lot of the times uh, your leaders will take care of you. Nice. Uh, and then you have been in many places. Like, can you share like a little bit of each place that you have been? Like Japan, you've been in Okinawa, uh, Okinawa right? And uh, you've been in uh, Belize, etc. So can you share a little bit for those that are listening with those experiences? So the Marine Corps has given me so many opportunities to deploy all over the world. Mm -hmm. So I've been to Iraq, Afghanistan, I've been to Belize. We deployed to Belize as part of the unit, not, I think it was the unit task program. This was back in 2012. And we deployed with Task Force Red Horse, the Air Force. Mm -hmm. and oh, the Red Horse, yeah, I know that. Yeah, and, and getting to work with the Air Force Reserves mm -hmm. and seeing their professionalism and how they built the relationships with the locals in Belize. The Red Horse are the engineers, right? They're engineers. And, and you be able, you're providing logistics oversight to them. Yes. If I'm, I'm just I'm making dots right now. Oh, okay. No, at that time, I was assigned as a civil affairs oh, OIC. Oh, civil affairs. Okay, okay. Right. And so, so what I was doing is we were canvassing what the capabilities were for the Belize to handle um, a humanitarian crisis okay. and then figure out if if an event like that happened, where would they need help? So then it feeds the plans for crisis response for the DOD. Gotcha. And so all of our daily reports would feed that. We worked with um, the government in Belmapan, that was the um, the capital of Belize mm -hmm. at that time. And, and we worked with the crisis response people there. Mm -hmm. And that taught me just respect for different ideas, different governments, and an understanding that the American way is not the, the only way, right? Okay. It's not the only way. There are so many things and so many ways to that the military helps other governments as long as you're open to that. Yeah, so, so it's, it's great to hear that you said the American way is not the only way because we are, we'll have partner nations and we have been deployed in situations that have been in Jordan, for example, and I had to share experiences with the Jordanians about how they conduct business versus how we conduct business. And then we can share those, you know, lessons learned one each other, right? So yeah. it, it's pretty cool and pretty amazing to see that you have that experience. Yeah. Now, any... Will you do like any logistical challenges in any of those de deployments? Uh, can you share with us? Okay. So fast forward a couple of years later, mm -hmm. I was the battalion S4 okay. for um, third battalion, third Marines. So I was the the cap. I was a captain okay. at that time. Mm -hmm. We were stationed in Hawaii, and part of the unit deployment program is we have to deploy the unit to Okinawa for six months, mm -hmm. and then while we're in Okinawa. We got on um, the USS Baham Richard. It was the U the BHR's last sail before the accident in San Diego. Mm -hmm. So we, our battalion was was there when we went all over the Pacific. So we offloaded in Thailand, um, went into Cobra Gold, then went Cobra to the Gold. Philippines, mm -hmm. then went to um, Korea for Songyang. Yeah. So I had to plan the movement of about 1,200 Marines because it's, it's not just the infantry battalion, but all the attachments, the artillery units. When we got to Okinawa, before we embarked, then we got attached a, a small aviation element because mm -hmm. it was only one ship, so it was a little bit of a smaller Marine Air Ground Task Force, mm -hmm. just small for the, for the exercises. But throughout that whole entire six months, 
we were moving personnel, we were moving cargo, we were moving equipment. I was working with the Thais, I was working with the Koreans, we were working with our higher headquarters, with our service component, yeah. and being able to synchronize all that information really taught me to rely on the lieutenant. So the lieutenant, each of the lieutenants, I had five lieutenants at the time, and each of them was an expert in, in everything. Okay. And they taught me to trust them okay. almost explicitly, nice. right? Because one, the work is so broad, you can't do it by yourself. Uh -huh. So even if you try, you're gonna fail. <laughs> yeah. But the lieutenants were so, they were just great leaders and stream professionals. And all of us putting together our experiences, mm -hmm. that's what made us really um, help the battalion get to where it needed yeah. to go. Yeah, yeah, no, great point, ma'am, that uh, sometimes we want to do everything by ourselves, but when we have these big uh, events like deployments like that throughout the whole Pacific, I can't imagine all the pieces that you have to do, equipment, personnel, flights, em yes. uh, embarkations, etc. It's a lot of work. Yes. So in your case, you're learning like, hey, I have my lieutenants, and I'm going to delegate taskings, and I'm going to trust and verify, right? Because at the end, yes. you will tr trust them, but yeah. you Verify. Yeah, and you build the plan. Mm -hmm. So I, I saw my job as as developing the framework okay. for them to operate in, mm -hmm. and then letting them operate within their framework mm -hmm. as long as we met the deadlines. The deadlines yeah. So I created like all the deadlines that we had to meet based mm -hmm. on you know customs clearances at different countries, and they all vary. Um, when we had to submit for flights, when we had to submit to our assignment to shipping, mm -hmm. all sorts of different things. So you put it all on an outline, you have to be really, really organized, you have to be disciplined. And then, but once it comes to execution time, then that's the staff NCOs and the lieutenants. <laughs> no, of course, and you, you, you'll have your lieutenants and the NCOs, uh, you know, to help the lieutenants to perform their jobs, yeah. right? Because we will not forget Never, yeah. our NCOs. Yeah. Because, uh, and we, we, we say that our NCOs in the Army are the backbone of the, of the Army. Yeah. And, you know, although we plan, they'll execute. Yeah. Um, but it's pretty amazing how you can actually do the framework as a captain, right? And do all this, you know, move yeah. all these pieces all together. And it's with the Marines' inputs. So I don't build the, build the plan by myself. Like the ammo chief. Right. Would have to tell me, like, ma'am, yeah, remember don't this. Don't forget about the sheep. <laughs> remember this. Remember this. And I'm like, okay, I can't forget about this. And and I built the plan with all the SMEs. Yeah. Then we we all kind of slap the table. This is the plan, and then nice. they execute. Nice. Yes. That's pretty, um, uh, pretty uh, good to hear, because uh, I know we, we we have some leaders listening to this uh, podcast right now, and they, they can feed about how they can do this big works. You know, I mean, big planning. Trust delegate, but then get feedbacks from the, from other personnel, like yes. the chief. You know, let's talk about chiefs, right? We cannot forget them. Yes. <laughs> They're SMEs, right? Subject matter yes. experts. Our lieutenants, our NCOs, yes. our Marine, right? Or soldiers, right? Yeah. It's pretty good. Now, so so once you've been uh, through your through career, you're now at a strategic and analyst role. So how your career is set up to what you're doing right now? How you been set? Um, so it started when I got the job at the city of Oak of Antioch as a building secretary. Okay. So it's a little bit of a long story, but I was working at the Contra Costa Times, like I told you, and I was trying to work on my bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. But the work just kept getting more and more. We had to work a lot more overtime, and I kept missing classes. Mm -hmm. And I had to make a decision, do I want to get my degree or do I want to work? And I really wanted to get my degree. So I looked for another job that was closer to home, that was more stable, that I didn't have to work as much overtime. And it happened that the city of Antioch was, was hiring and I, I got hired on as the building secretary, the building department secretary. While I went to school and while I was there, I got promoted to become a building, a community, a community development tech, which meant that I could issue permits for engineering permits okay. for building 
roads or fixing, not building roads, fixing roads. Fixing, okay. And then the same thing as small builds for, or small fixes for homes and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that taught me how a city works. Oh, okay. And all the planning that happens to provide services for a city. And to me, it seemed very similar to my job in logistics, right? And as I became an officer, I didn't really know at that time, you know, where my career was going to go. Mm -hmm. But after my trip to Belize, I came back and I was up for orders and I got selected to go to the Expeditionary Warfare School. Mm -hmm. And there you learn, you learn about the Marine Corps and how the Marine Corps fights. And at Marine Corps University, I learned that they have a program to train and educate officers to develop the war plans for DOD, for the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's what I want to do. Because I felt like my experience as a city planner prepared me yeah, for that. Prepare you for, for your next, yes. you know, what are you doing right now? But I didn't really know how to get there yet, you know, but it, I, things always work out if you work hard. Yeah. So I, coming out of EWS, I, I left with this immense responsibility that I have to prepare myself at all times, that I have to read, 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 because my experience is just one, but when you read, you, get, you gather experience of hundreds of years, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I became more disciplined in my reading. And as a, as a chance meeting, I ran into one of the planners when I was stationed in, in Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And I ran into this major at the, you know, at the headquarters. And he needed some assistance prepping his meeting for the general. And at the end of it, he was very appreciative and said, Mariela, what are you reading? And then I was reading, you know, some war book. I don't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. And he was very impressed about it because I was excited about it. And he's like, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to go to the School of Advanced, war, Advanced war Fighting." Mm -hmm. And then he, he was a planner. And so he, he said, come see me later. And I made an appointment to go see him. I was prepared. I brought, like, my resume, all the books that I read. I, I was ready. And, and then... I showed up to the meeting and he's like, okay, you're ready, you're ready. And he just gave me some advice on, on my, when I should apply, what the process was. And when I, I got moved to Hawaii, I pcs again, and I got moved to Hawaii. And he said, tell your command and staff instructor, because I, I enrolled in school right after that, mm -hmm. which is the, the major's career level school. Okay. That's command and staff. I told my command and staff instructor that's what I wanted to do. Yes. I did well at command and staff, and he made a, a good recommendation, and he was also a planner. And so he mentored me. He reviewed my package. And so what I learned from that experience is to tell people your dreams. Sometimes we're afraid to share our dreams with people because, you know, maybe they're not possible, but, like, Tell people when it helps, com it helps you commit yeah. to yourself, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And it helps you imagine when you verbalize mm -hmm. what, what you want to do in the future. Gotcha. And, and for me, so far, it has worked out. Nice. So you definitely uh, verbalize your dreams. And then the other part of this is like having mentors, right? That yes. Try, that they can guide you through, through the process. Because yes. like... Sometimes we feel ourselves that we can do everything, like, yes. like we were saying before, like, oh, yeah, I can do everything. But we have to find those outlets that can, hey, I need guidance on how to become a strategic analyst in yes. the Marine Corps, for example. Yes. Right? And then yeah. that's your piece of advice. Yeah. So after, after I went to the School of Advanced War Fighting, I got sent down to the first Marine Logistics Group as a planner. Mm -hmm. So I was, um, I was writing the... The war plans for the MLG. What what is the mar the the Marine Logistics Group support plan mm -hmm. if we go to any contingency? So that was my job for two years. And out of the blue, I was thinking about what am I going to do next. So I started asking around. The same thing, yeah. reaching out to my mentors. Right, right. 
what could be a good next step for me uh, okay. before I get promoted to lieutenant colonel because there was some st there was some time there right. that I had to fill and I wanted to go to a joint duty I wanted to do something different yeah. and through those conversations my my package got sent up to this office and they reviewed my package and they, they approved my orders for me to come last year. Nice, nice. Yes. You've been in Washington, D.C. working in that same position. So can you share a little bit of what you do as a strategic analyst? We do uh, research on behalf of the Commandant of the Marine Corps okay. to prevent strategic surprise. Okay. So the way I think of it is we're looking past a couple of ridge lines on behalf of the Commandant and so then we can look at trends mm -hmm. in the future and what the Marine Corps' rules and missions are going to be in the future. Okay, so you, you're thinking ahead. So it's yes. a, like a future planning for the Marine yes. Corps. So yes. That's pretty awesome. And then what's next for you like after this? The, so yeah. I'm here for another two, three years. Mm -hmm. And I'm screening for command this summer. Nice. And so if, if I get command, then I'll go where I'm sent. If I don't get command, then I'll stay here for another year and see if another opportunity comes up so I can continue my service. Do you, will, do you have any, any particular unit that you want to command or is like whatever the Marines select for me? My dream has always been to um, be on the Marine Expeditionary Unit. Okay. So even though we were on ship when I was with 3-3, mm -hmm. it wasn't a MU. And that's always just been a dream of mine. One of the driving reasons why I came on active duty was I wanted to go on a MU. And because I thought I would be good at it. I thought I would be good at moving nice. personnel all over the world. And um, that would be my number one. Okay. And then my, my number two, like the list just came out a few days ago. Okay. So as I'm looking through the list, like, I would just be honored to be selected. No, of so course. I'll go course. anywhere. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, at this point, I'm just curious because, like, yeah. sometimes we have preferences based on yes. our background, right? Yes. Um, yeah. I'll give an example. I commanded in the Special Forces community okay. as, a, as a logistics uh, FSC, a forward support company. Okay. So as I move, I move forward, I would like to command back again to the SF because yes. that's my background, right? Yeah. So that's why I ask you. But at the yeah. end, you're looking for command, right? So yeah. whatever it comes, it, it comes yeah. and you'll be glad to actually yeah. command Marine through whatever uh, situation. Yeah. Um, now, as we uh, end on this podcast, ma'am, thank you for being here today. Uh, appreciate it. And, and again, I didn't say this at the, at the beginning, but congrats on your newly promotion as a Lieutenant Colonel. Thank you. Uh, now, what uh, advice will you offer to those that are listening, they're seeking or considering a career, in, whether it's going to be in the Marine Corps or any of the U.S. military branches. My first piece of advice would be that to develop the habit of discipline mm -hmm. in not your just not just your personal life, but your professional life, and then through discipline comes everything else, I believe. Like if you, if you make one step in the commitment to yourself, you know, and the examples, like make your bed every day, right? We've all read that book, Make Your Bed. But you make your bed, you've done something for yourself. You go PT. I, go, I, I like to PT. I do physical training in the mornings. I go run in the mornings. And that's a, the second thing I do for myself is... Then I take care of myself. I I develop my physical fitness so then I'm strong and I'm capable or I feel capable, right, of, of taking on that next challenge. Gotcha. And I take care of myself. I eat well. And taking care of yourself then and having that discipline then helps you prepare for the next thing and the next thing. I've developed a very disciplined reading schedule a self-development schedule. I've, I'm always either in school. If I'm not in school, then I'm reading. Then I, I'm volunteering. I'm always trying to find opportunities that expand my leadership and that expand my experiences. Like when I was a junior Marine, I was the only female in my unit. So like I wasn't in charge of anybody. They were like, oh, there's just Pena over there. 
and I felt like I could be a leader, right? And but they weren't giving me that opportunity. I probably wasn't asking for it or anything. But I went to volunteer at the Marine Corps League, and and through that experience, gave me the confidence okay. to then grow in my Marine Corps role, which then helped me in my civilian role. Mm -hmm. And it's through small steps of keeping those commitments to yourself mm -hmm. is how you can expand your life, essentially. Yeah, thank you for those uh, wisdom words, ma'am. I know uh, people will take it for those that are listening right now in the podcast. Now, as a lifetime member of the ANSA, uh, you know, I want to highlight that and thank you to Lieutenant Colonel Montalban that he might be listening to this podcast now. Um, what 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 advice you can give for those that are seeking mentorship? Let's say they want to join the ANSA community uh, because now ANSA is open to enlisted and officers. So, as a lifetime member, how, what what you can give advice for those that are listening to the ANSA? Community? So, I would recommend going to an ANSA symposium, mm -hmm. yes. and in that symposium, make a challenge to meet. X number of people that you're comfortable with, you know, per hour, per day, because the ANSO symposium sometimes are two days long, mm -hmm. and then get out of your comfort zone, talk to as many people as possible, and you'll find that there's going to be a connection that you make with somebody. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid after somebody speaks and it resonates with you mm -hmm. to go up to them and talk to them, mm -hmm. and then ask them for their contact information, and then follow up. But when you follow up, when you, when you want to make a connection, especially with a senior leader, mm -hmm. you, you want to be thoughtful in the, in the time one that you take from them mm -hmm. or that you're asking from them. So you want to have a plan of, on what you want to receive from that person mm -hmm. and, and then communicate that effectively okay. and then follow up and then follow up and through constant engagement, right. then a friendship forms. Right. And that's how human connections are made. Yes. And it only starts with you, though. Like, if you go to an ANSO symposium and don't talk to anybody, like, ANSO is not going to come to you. Mm -hmm. The feeling of ANSO, of the community that everyone that is a member there has built, mm -hmm. it's because we all make an effort to to develop relationships and to get to know each other, support each other, mm -hmm. um, and that comes through being a little bit of a little bit vulnerable. Right. Yeah. Right. So yes, talking about speaking about ANSO um, symposium, there's one coming up uh, this summer uh, on the East Region. So if you're mm -hmm. looking to be in the ANSO symposium, more than welcome, and then you can actually have these conversations and do networking while you in the symposium, right? Yes. Yeah. Appreciate the time for being here. Uh, it's a truly honor to be here and talking to you. I uh, wish the best of luck that you get selected for your command. So Thank you. we're gonna look forward. Next time we speak, I'm gonna speak with a battalion commander, right? <laughs> uh, so that, that we, we're gonna put that. Any other that you want to share with the audience before we wrap it up? Any other uh, thoughts or wisdom? Closing comments. I would, the closing comments I would have is to say thank you to you and to the ANSO community for giving me this opportunity to share my story. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we, we, we find it hard to tell about our personal hardships that we experience, mm -hmm. especially when we were kids. Yeah. But a lot, in a lot of reasons, because of ANSO uh, and, and being supported through the ANSO community, I've shared, a, and also the Sea Services Leadership Association. Okay. Um, through those communities of uh, both men and women, then I've been able to open up in ways that I hadn't before. And, and so for me, ANSO and all the affinity groups that, um, that are available to all of us, it helps us to become more ready in our service to our country. Nice. Appreciate it, man. Thank you for, for being here. Now we're going to enjoy this amazing meal that we have here. I appreciate it. It was a great place. Again, we're in the Potomac Winery here in Stafford, Virginia. So again, 
Thank you, ma'am, for being here. Thank you. Lieutenant Colonel Peña, it's, it's been an absolute honor uh, to, to host you here in the Answer Podcast again. Thank you. Uh, your story is, is truly inspiring for me, for us, and for the Answer community, and for everyone that's listening right now. Thank you thank for you. sharing that. Um, now, thank you for joining us and, and sharing and listening to this journey. Uh, thank you for our listeners to tune in in the Answer Podcast. Be sure to follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and our other social channels at Ansel Mill for more inspiring stories. Uh, join us next time to the Ansel Podcast uh, for more conversation with incredible guests like Lieutenant Corona Peña. Until then, uh, stay motivated and continue making a difference. This is Manuel Cala signing off. Let's go.